Amen. Mark chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 14. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse number 14. It reads like this from the English Standard Version. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, excuse me, Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them and left their, their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. I want to read verse number 17 and 18 again. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of me. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As you take your seats, um, I was trying to decide which title to give this sermon on this morning. Um, we're starting a new series today called What If, and I was going back and forth between what if you did this too, <laughs> but I finally settled on what if this is your opportunity. What if this is your opportunity? Help me by talking to your neighbor, greeting them, saying hello. And then ask them, what if this is your opportunity? Just a little over a year after leaving office on April the 23rd, 1910, the 26th president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, delivered one of his most famous speeches entitled Citizenship in a Republic. It was at a very famous university in Paris that he gave this speech, and it is popularly known as the man in the arena. Because of this famous popularized quote that's found in the speech, probably about halfway through the speech, Many of you, I'm sure, have heard it before. Perhaps you've heard Brene Brown quote it before. It says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better, but the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement or who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. Through the vivid imagery of these words, Teddy Roosevelt inspired many to move off the sidelines of critique and complacency and reluctancy and into the arena to strive valiantly to actually give oneself to a worthy cause, or as he says, to dare greatly. And this morning, as we begin this new sermon series that we are entitling, What If?, we sense and realize that there are many opportunities before many of us that God has been calling us into, that perhaps we've been evading or avoiding. And he's inviting us to get off of the sidelines and into the arena to advance what he is doing in this world, not just your own agenda. Because 
We never know what is on the other side of our what if moments. What if you moved out on that thing that God has been nudging you to do and calling you to do and prompting you to do for his kingdom? What are you waiting for? I often consider, what if Pastor T.L. and Sister Mabel Rogers had not done something as crazy as start a church? Back in 1987, during a time when church planning wasn't popular or trendy like it is today, everybody's planting the church today. But it was not that way when they started a church back in 1987. And I consider sometimes, what if I had not listened to my mom when she urged me to transfer to the University of Maryland so that I could come home and I could be close in order to help serve in ministry? What my life would have looked like had I not accepted that invitation? The truth is, is that we're all sitting here today on this side of someone's what if moment. We're sitting on the side of somebody having a what if moment and they obeyed God. They did what God said to do. Someone sitting here this moment because of morning because of a grandmother or a grandfather or some distant ancestor who decided to follow what may have seemed to be an unusual prompting from the Lord. Or someone else is here this morning because You said yes to an invitation from a friend who said to themselves, what if I invited them to church? And you are here today because they decided to invite you to church. But what's even more fascinating to me is that we are all sitting here this morning because over 2,000 years ago, these four men in the Bible, in our passage, They said yes to Jesus' invitation to follow him. Literally, because they said yes to Jesus' invitation, we are sitting here this morning. If you think about it, what if they had told Jesus, like many of us do when Jesus invites us into a close relationship with him, we would say to him, perhaps they would say to him, nah, Jesus, I'm good. I'm just going to catch these little fish over here, make a little bit of money, take care of my family, stash some money up and put in a 401k for my retirement. And hopefully if I, if, if I make enough money and stash enough money up, I can move to the countryside of Judea and I can just ride this thing out. What if they had said that to Jesus? Jesus, maybe I'll catch up with you a little bit later to do this following you thing. Sometimes I think we need to demystify the scriptures and remember that these were real people living real lives. I want us to realize that when Jesus pulled up on Simon and Peter and um, Simon Peter and Andrew, his brother, and then also James and John, when he pulled up on him, it was just a regular, ordinary work day for them. But they did not know what was in store for them on this regular, ordinary workday. In fact, this day that Jesus approached them was not unlike every day that they woke up and went to work. Just like tomorrow when you wake up and go to work, it will be just a regular day. It was a regular day for them. Perhaps they were late for work that morning. After they had packed their lunch, they were on their way to work and they forgot, oh, I forgot that bait that I cut up last night. And I need to go back home to get it. And so they got to the lake, the Sea of Galilee, late that morning. It was just an ordinary day. They packed lunch. They caught a ride. They got to the sea. And on this regular day, they were doing what they did. They were fishing. Some of them were literally wading in the water, probably about knee deep or thigh deep. And they would have these large nets. They wouldn't fish like we would with a hook and a reel. They would have these large nets, and they would put some bait in the net, and they would cast the net out in the sea and throw it down quickly on the water to try to catch whatever fish they could and then pull it back up. It was hard labor. That You probably can hear them if you're at the seashore right now listening, hearing them grunting, hearing the, 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 the net hitting the, hitting the lake. It, it, if you can hear it and if you can smell it even, the sweet breeze from that sweet water coming off. And it's just a normal day for them. Perhaps you even hear people yelling and grunting across the water. Hey, what did you catch over there? Is there good fishing over there? 
In fact, many suggest that they were skilled, shrewd, and successful businessmen because they were good at their craft, at negotiating and knowing how to sell their fish. They were savvy businessmen, and this was just an ordinary day, and they were successful at what they were doing. If you look as Jesus is walking along the beach, the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the mountains, the hilly mountains are off in the terrain. You can see it. I've been there. It's a beautiful part of the world. And here it is. Jesus pulls up on them. And little did they know that this ordinary workday was about to become the most unordinary day, a day that, not would, only, that would not only change their life, but a day that would change the world forever. This passage is even basically the seeds that are planted that begins the Christian church because these men decided to follow Jesus when he gave them this bold and audacious invitation. Do you know that Jesus wants to meet you on a regular, ordinary day? and turn your day into the most extraordinary day that you will ever have. I think we miss Jesus sometimes in the ordinary moments. And he's visiting us with his whispers. He's visiting us with that song. He's visiting us with somebody calling us and encouraging us and prompting us to do something that perhaps we didn't want to do even before that. And I believe even this morning, he has begun to reignite something that had gone dormant in your spirit some dream that you are sleeping on, some calling that you don't want to walk into, you want to keep avoiding, some ministry that he wants you to do to minister to people who nobody else wants to minister to. I believe he's speaking to you even this morning, just like he was speaking to Simon and Andrew as they were casting their net in the seas. He had been scouting them out. He had been seeking them out. And he says to them, after he pulls up on them, he pulls up on them. It was like he had seen them off in the distance. And he pulls up on them. He says to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, not only is this a drop the mic moment, but this is a drop the nets moment. Because Mark tells us, that they did not hesitate and nor were they reluctant to drop their nets and follow Jesus. It says immediately they left their nets to follow him. How does this happen? Now, Mark does not let us know whether or not they knew Jesus at this point, whether or not they'd had any encounters with Jesus at this point. But we just, Mark really is just trying to get to the point. He's trying to make the point to get to the point so that we would all know that whenever Jesus invites us into a closer walk with him, the proper response is to seriously and urgently and promptly and completely follow him in what he says. Because too many of us are too reluctant when Jesus comes inviting us. We're saying, Jesus... Can I put this off for another day? I'm trying to make this money. Jesus, can I put this off for another day? I'm too tired right now. Jesus, can I put this off for another day? I've got too much stuff going on in my life. I'm too busy. I'm too stressed. I'm too troubled. There's too much difficulties in my life. I'm in too much debt. God, Jesus, now is not a good time. But they were dealing with everything that we were dealing with. They were dealing with life. They were dealing with money. They were dealing with stress. They were dealing with difficulties. They were people just like we are people, and yet they left everything, dropped their nets immediately to follow Jesus. Too often we drag our feet, and we don't take Jesus' promptings seriously, and we don't raise his promptings to a level of importance that he demands, that it demands. And little do we know that on the other side, of our what-if moments are something that will change our lives for forever. And not just our life, but perhaps would change generations forever. Because again, this passage lets us know that this is how we got here today because these disciples decided to follow Jesus and take his call seriously. Jesus was trying to tell them that 
yeah, I know you got a secular gig and I know you're making that money, but I'm going to help you become something that is going to be even more significant than what you're doing right now. Jesus was calling them into something greater. And I know you've heard it before, but we all need to hear it again this morning that God is calling all of us into something greater. He does not want us to settle for just what we can do. He doesn't want us to settle just with what we can accomplish, what we can accumulate with our own effort of our own hands. But he's inviting us to follow him so intently and so completely and so promptly that we become something that we cannot become without him. I know y'all been killing it. You're doing everything. You're making all this money. You're all successful. You have all these things going for you, degrees behind your name. But Jesus invites us to be something that we cannot be without him. In fact, what this passage is encourages us to see is just like he saw Simon and Andrew and James and John along that shore and pulls up on him, on them, he's pulling up on us as well. And he says to them, like he is saying to us today, I will make you become fishers of men. I'm going to make you become something that you are not right now. And when he's pulling up on us, it is a reminder that he is always coming after us. See, in this passage, what's interesting is that during this time, a teacher or a rabbi would never go out to find students. Students would always go to find a teacher or a rabbi and ask that teacher or rabbi to disciple them. But Jesus is doing something that is so counterculture at this time. He is actually going out to find students and saying to students, come follow me and let me disciple you. And the reason why this is so important is because this is the gospel on full display. Because most religions tell you, all other religions besides Christianity tell you that you need to do something to get closer to God, that you need to do something in order to get to God. But the gospel tells us, and what this passage tells us is that Jesus is doing something to come to us, that Jesus is doing something to get near to us. Jesus is pulling up on you. He knows where you live. He knows your name, and he's trying to get your attention. And that's what's so beautiful about the gospel is that we don't have to do anything to get to God. God does everything to get to us. And here Jesus is not only asking them to follow him, but he's asking us to follow him well as well. He is seeking them out, just like he is seeking you out, just like he made sure that you were going to be here this morning to hear this message because he is coming after you. And as he's coming after you, as he was coming after them, he sought them out. And he knew every difficulty that they were going through, just like he knows every difficulty that you're going through. He knows every trial, every tribulation that you're going through. Matter of fact, that's what the old hymn of the church, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, says. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged because we can never find a friend more faithful than Jesus. He he knows our every weakness, y'all. He knows what you're going through. And yet he's still asking you to follow him. I love this old other old hymn of the church. It says, um, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. That means that Jesus was seeking me to come near to me and to do something about my situation. And that's what the truth is this morning, is that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, Jesus is still coming to you. And he knows what you're going through. He knows it's difficult, but yet he's still asking you to follow him. But do notice that Jesus says to them, I will make you become fishers of men. That language is progressive language. Jesus is not saying that you're going to become fishers of men overnight. He's inviting them into a process of becoming disciples of Jesus. Becoming a disciple of Jesus does not happen overnight. 
Salvation does. Happens immediately. But becoming a disciple of Jesus, it is something that is methodical. It is something that sometimes feels slow. It's something that sometimes feels painful. And sometimes he's shaping and, 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 and carving stuff off of you, chipping stuff off of you so that you can be changed to look like him. But he's still using this process called discipleship in order to help you become more like him. He tells them, I will make you become fishers of men. And so even though sometimes it's slow, even though sometimes it's painful, even though sometimes it's uncertain, the truth of the matter is, is that it will be worth it in the end. And I point this out because it's important that I do not give some false sense of hope, that as soon as you accept Jesus' call on your life and that he's inviting you to, that everything is going to be fine and dandy. That all your trials are going to go away, all your bills are going to be paid, you're not going to have no more difficulty, no more troubles. No, that's not what the scriptures offer us. That's not even what Jesus is offering us. He's not promising us, us an easy life, but he is promising us an eternal life. And so it will be worth it in the end. And so these disciples, they drop everything to follow him. Even though they probably had difficulties and trials and struggles, because we would know that even in their following him, they would stumble along the way as well. Y'all do know that this guy named Simon is the same guy whose name was turned to Peter. And you remember what Peter does, right? He's always sticking his foot in his mouth, right? <laughs> He's the same guy who says, Jesus, you're the son of man. And then in the next, Satan, um, in the next moment, he's saying, nah, Jesus, I don't want you getting killed. And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. He's the same guy who, he walks out on water. By faith, he sees Jesus, and he is walking on water. And then, while he's walking on water, he starts looking around, doubting, and sees the winds and the waves, and he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he starts drowning. This is that same Peter. He would make mistakes. He would also be the same one who would deny Jesus three times when Jesus was on his way to the cross. But then Jesus would invite him back in and tell, tell him, ask him, do you love me, in order to return him and restore him into a relationship. See, th this is a reminder that, even in our discipleship walk, there are going to be some ups and there are going to be some downs. But I, I really want us to, to understand how important this passage is. Because this passage is really about discipleship. And we don't take discipleship seriously in our churches these days and times. See, what Jesus was inviting them into was discipleship, not to be a Christian. Jesus was inviting them to discipleship, not to be a church member. Jesus was inviting them to discipleship, not to be a preacher. Jesus was discipling, um, inviting them into following him to be a disciple of him so that they would look like him. Not all these other things that we've made following Jesus out to be. And I want to pose this question to you. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Because discipleship was actually the only solution to the problem that Jesus was facing. I was gripped all week long. At the start of this passage, it says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. It's when John, his forerunner, his dude, his God that baptized him. John, the one who was so weird, he was out in the countryside eating locusts and wearing little loincloths and carrying It was this guy, but he was the prophet. He was the one that was preparing the way of Jesus, and he was the one that was pointing people to Jesus, and now he gets arrested. And it's after he gets arrested that Jesus comes to start looking for disciples. I mean, I just can't imagine. I know Jesus was super spiritual and holy. He knew that John had to be arrested, all that. But, but can you, even the, they say the original readers of this passage, they would have been scared because they knew the danger of following Jesus. This was a new faith, a new religion. And so literally people were getting hanged at the stake. And, and, and Jesus had just learned that his friend was arrested. And you know what Jesus had to be concerned about? 
that they were coming for him next. And Jesus' solution was discipleship. Jesus' solution to the problem that he was facing was discipleship. And I can't imagine how afraid, if I could say, or how trepidatious or how concerned Jesus must have been during this time when John was just arrested. He knew this guy, and he thought that this guy was the man, and now he has to do something. He's got to continue on in ministry. He's got to continue on in mission. And I think that Jesus models something for us in this passage. And one of the first things I think that he models for us is that when we receive the invitation to follow Jesus, we've got to stay on mission even when it gets messy. Many of us, when things get hard, when we find out that somebody else is going through We're like, well, then why am I going to believe this Jesus stuff if that's what's happening to them? Why am I going to continue to serve Jesus when it seems like i got problems and difficulties everywhere? Listen, Jesus was faced with difficulty, but he had the mindset to understand that i got to stay on mission even though the situation around me is not like I want it to be. And so many of us, we get stuck there. We can never get past that place to get on the other side of our what if moments because we get stuck at the place where we want everything to be just right before we advance to do what he's calling us to do. We want all the conditions to be right. We want to have all the sleep that we have. We want all of our debts to be paid. We want everything to be just right, the temperature to be just right. It's got to be on a day that's not cloudy. It's got to be on a day it's not humid outside. It's got to be on a day when I'm feeling good. No, 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 no. Jesus advanced his mission even when the situation was uncertain. And if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, we have to stay on mission. Jesus knew that the solution to the problem he was facing was discipleship. And so even after John got arrested, Jesus went and found some people to disciple. One of the uh, uh, most memorable sermons that Pastor Tanya has ever preached is a sermon where um, John the Baptist is in jail. And John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one? And Jesus says, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising the dead, yada, yada, yada. Blessed are you if you do not fall away on account of me. In other words, blessed are you if you are unoffended. I have a a, a sweatshirt in my closet that says unoffended on it. Because sometimes we have to advance even when we feel offended, even when the situation is not like we want it to be. And you need to stop waiting for the conditions to be perfect to do what God has called you to do. In the church, people are... So now when I say the church, not just our church, but the church at large are so frantic and panicking because it seems like people are leaving the church. If you look at the numbers of people, the percentage of people who are going to church now compared to just 30 years ago, it's a drastic drop. And so people are concerned about what do we do to get people back in church? I don't think that we have a church membership problem. I think we have a church discipleship problem. Because people are not seriously committed to the discipleship process. And people in the church are not discipling people seriously either. D.L. Moody, famous preacher of Chicago, back in the day, he said, it is better to train 10 people than to do the work of 10 people. But it is harder. And the reason why most of us don't get involved in discipleship is because it's hard. It's not overnight. Jesus says, I will make you become disciples. But the solution to the problems that you and I face is discipleship. If we would promptly, eagerly, urgently, seriously 
follow Jesus and really take discipleship seriously, many of the problems that we're facing in our lives and in our world and in our churches would go away. This morning, I think that there's some people in the room who you need to take discipleship seriously. And that means that you begin to disciple somebody else. That the solution to the problems that we are seeing is you taking on the responsibility of finding somebody else and saying, follow me. Let me take you out to dinner once every two weeks. Come over my house and just hang out with me for um, once a month. I want to do life with you. Listen, it's not a quick fix, but it is a lasting fix to the problems that we are facing in our world and in our lives. Somebody needs to take discipleship seriously in that you commit to being discipled. Pastor T.L. just mentioned on Wednesday night, we're having Bible study. I just wonder how many of the people here on Sunday morning who consider them Christians are going to be here on Wednesday night to study God's word together. To actually engage urgently, seriously, take it important to study God's word and to grow and to become more like Jesus. Some of you, you even have seen in someone else what you know you need in your life. You've been observing somebody else and you see, man, they, they, they got to go. I, I know their marriage not perfect, but they still together after 50 years. And you know you need to go and ask them to disciple you. You need to say, can I take you out to lunch at least once a month and you just pour into me everything that you have to pour into me? This is what we need in our churches today, y'all. This is the solution to the problems that we are facing in our world today is if Christians were actually disciples of Jesus and look like Jesus, a whole lot of what we have going on would change. And I know I'm right about it because Jesus took 12 disciples and changed the world. Jesus in a less amount of time than most of us have, in just three years, poured intently and intensely and intentionally into these 12 men. And through those 12 men, he turned the world right side up. We're sitting here today because of what Jesus took seriously about discipleship and what they took seriously when he asked, invited them to follow me. Some of you, have inside of you, because of what you've learned, because of what you've gone through, something that somebody else needs, and you're keeping it to yourself. You've been through something that somebody is going through, and they don't know that you've gone through it, and you're sitting on the other side of it victorious, and they need what you have. Are you going to sit on this opportunity that Jesus is calling us to take discipleship seriously? Jesus, he stays on mission because Jesus knows you can't take time for granted. It says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus knew he only had a short amount of time. And some of us, we think we have all the time in the world. But this idea of the time is fulfilled, it's actually found in other places in scriptures. It's this idea of a kairos moment. It is a moment that you have to seize the opportunity because it's like all the factors are there for it to go to um, for, for God to do what he wants to do. And this is the time. It was the time that had been prophesied all throughout Old Testament. It was finally coming near Galatians chapter four, verse four. It says it this way. 
When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons and daughters. And so it is the time when Jesus came because he knew it was the appointed time. He knew it was the right time. That's why Jesus was born at the time he was, because all the conditions were such that he needed to be born then to save souls. And so he knew this time had been fulfilled. It is also like in Romans. Romans 5 and 6, I believe, um, while we were yet sinners, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. It was the right time, and Jesus seized the moment. He says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand, and something new is on the scene. Are y'all going to get with me or not? He says, repent and believe this good news that something new is now on the scene. And he's calling all of us to respond in the same way, to repent and to believe the good news and to get involved in the work of following him so that we can help change this world over as well. What does your response to come follow me look like? What does you taking discipleship seriously look like? Does that mean you discipling somebody else? Does that mean asking somebody else to disciple you? Does that mean moving out on that thing that you know God has been prompting you to do? And I want to say this again, because when God is calling you, he's not always calling you to the stage. He's not always calling to you to what we see in the front of the room. He also calls us to do things for his kingdom that will last even beyond the stage. Because I won't be on this stage for forever. Nobody will ever be on this stage for forever. It is about what we do as a local church in growing disciples and making disciples of Jesus Christ. If you're just waiting for the stage, that's not your true call of life. So I have been convicted in this way in my own personal life. And this week, I started. I started with three men who I am going to meet every other week with and just disciple and pour whatever I have into somebody else. And I don't want to do this alone. If things are going to change, we have got to take discipleship seriously. Who are you going to pour into? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to invite to dinner? Who are you going to ask to take out to lunch so that they can pour into you? Um, we have access to this online discipleship material called Right Now Media. Yeah. Right Now Media, it's, it's online, it's videos, and so you watch these videos and then you get together. You're not supposed to do discipleship alone. Discipleship is never done alone. Nobody ever did discipleship alone. Everybody always did discipleship in community. So you can't do it alone. But if you will decide to be a part of a group of people who wants to go through these video devotionals together, um, video um, discipleship material together, email me and I will gladly give you the link so that you can be in community with somebody else to be discipled, that you would take discipleship seriously. Last week I was so blown away that after service, after we called people to the altar, Someone told me that um, before I had called people to the altar that they had been prompted by the Holy Spirit to write two questions on a piece of paper to give to two other men in the church. And on that piece of paper, they wrote, before we call people to the altar, are you ready to make, are you ready to move to the next level in ministry? And then the second question was, where is God calling you to? That person didn't even know that this week we would be starting this series called What If?, and that I would be preaching about discipleship this week. But that's the Holy Spirit working in our midst. And I don't want us to miss this moment, this opportunity. What if this is your opportunity to really take discipleship seriously? Jesus turned the world upside down, right side up with just 12 men, actually a little bit more because he has some women too, 
but he poured into these people. And I want you to know that if you would follow him, that Jesus will prove yourself, himself to you over and over and over again. Just like he proved himself to you when he visited you and he spoke to you and you received salvation, he's visiting you again and again and again. And he's asking you to take this next step to taking discipleship seriously. He's proven that he will provide. He's proven that he will protect you. He's proven that he will help you. He's proven that he will strengthen you. Is there anybody in the room who can say that Jesus has proven himself to be faithful over and over and over again? So if he's been faithful with that in your life, I know it may not be an overnight, right now, immediate solution, but he wants to help you become a fisher of men. He wants to help you now to begin fishing for men that our world, that your family, that your neighborhood, that your job, that your church, that our country, that our world, would be changed because we take his call to make disciples of all nations seriously. He wants to do a work through me and you, and the conditions are never going to be exactly like you want them to be. He models for us to stay on mission, to stay on message, and to stay focused on the the method of which we should go about doing it, which is disciple making. Father God, I thank you for this time in your word. I pray that we would not miss this opportunity, that we would see that this morning you were visiting us as we peeked in on that Sea of Galilee shoreline, that we were being visited as well, and that you were beckoning us to come follow you, to take discipleship seriously, that we would move out on every prompting that you have been placing in us, and that in the future there would be people sitting in church because they are sitting on the other side of our what-if moment. That they would say it was because they took discipleship seriously that I am in church today. It's because they stepped out and did a ministry that seemed crazy that I am here today. It's because they decided to invite me to church that I am here today. God, I pray that you would seize this opportunity for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.